Welcome, everybody. I'm Phil Bickle on staff here at Awake Us Now as we continue our workshop on discipling and the gifts of the Spirit for sharing the gospel message. This session, too, has a... Uh, Additional title, The Gifts of the Spirit, Debunking the Lies and Exposing the Truth. That sounds like the title of some theological journal article or something. This is going to be heavy, right? Uh, not so much. And yet, we're going to deal with heavy issues. What we're talking about is the gifts of the Spirit. And they are gifts of light. They are gifts of power from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I didn't give those in the right order, but all four of those places. <laughs> and we're in the business especially of taking it to the ends of the earth. That's what we want to do. We need these gifts. These are the gifts that are mentioned specifically in the scripture. Uh, Pastor Dodd mentioned before, this isn't the complete list. God can be providing other kinds of gifts to his people anytime he wants. None of the list starts with, and these are the only ones. So it's wide open. But we'll focus on our thoughts on these. These are gifts that uh, every single one of them could easily be given an hour's lecture. I'll spare you that. <laughs> but I wanted you to see this complete biblical list so that it's something to pray about, something to study, something to seek God's direction about how to use them, how to, even how to define them. But there's a question that hovers over these gifts, that darkens the light and the power of these gifts. And that question is, are these gifts safe or are they dangerous? People throughout history, and especially in the Western world, where we're not that much into the supernatural, we ask that question. And the reason why we need to talk about debunking lies and exposing the truth is because of the ways that that question is answered incorrectly. I'm not coming here as someone who, I know all the truth and I'm going to debunk everything. What does that mean? To kick somebody out of bed or something? <laughs> to debunk. Anyway, you see, I, until I was 57, I believed those lies. I lived according to those lies. I ran my ministry according to the lies. And then God started exposing the truth. And it changed everything. Part of the reason why I bought into the fear of the Holy Spirit's gifts was that I'd never experienced them. And, you know, it's not so hard to deal with, oh, the gift number 15 there of helping. Well, that, that's not difficult for us. It doesn't seem dangerous. The gift of giving, oh, that's not so bad. It's not so dangerous. But, you know, even, even the gift of giving can be dangerous. I was in a church where there was one terrific giver. He was really rich. And whenever there was a need, he plunked down his money. And the result was, because of that sugar daddy, everybody else kept their wallets in their pockets, and that whole church did not know how to give because of the misuse of that gift. So even the gifts that we don't consider supernatural, they can be used wrong. But in particular, the ones down towards the lower left-hand corner here, the words of wisdom and knowledge, that God would give us information like that for use at a particular time, the gifts of healing, working of miracles, discerning spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting that message, casting out demons, and also number two on the list, prophecy, a message, a word from God, a vision from the Lord. That can happen today. We're not sure about those things. In fact, I hadn't experienced them, but also I'd been taught certain things about them. These gifts decreased over the first centuries of the church, and they ceased somewhere in the 300s, and they're gone. The Holy Spirit pulled them out because now we had 
all the scriptures. We had the written word, and we also had our expertise. We know what we're doing now, and we can run this according to our plans. And the other thing that I was taught was, ultimately, as we see this movement of the Holy Spirit coming at the beginning of the 20th century and then having a revival in the 60s and 70s, well, isn't all this Holy Spirit stuff dangerous and deceptive and divisive? That's what many people had experienced. Not all of them, but some people had. And so they assumed, stay away from this, it's dangerous. And I actually had friends who were into that kind of uh, movement of the Spirit doing miraculous things in the 70s. I had friends like that, and I'd listen to what they're doing, and it seemed good, but that wasn't my experience. In fact, I look back on, you know, the first uh, 25, 30 years of my ministry, and I was thankful that I didn't have any of that happening in the churches and places that I was working. I was thankful for something that really wasn't a blessing. <laughs> but then God started to do things. He started exposing the truth. And so I'm going to tell you some stories while we're doing some teaching that show how he did that. And they're not necessarily in chronological order. I want us to start by going down to Fort Myers, Florida, to a museum that I visited in January 2016. It's a museum that includes the home, and also the, uh, the laboratory of a fellow named Thomas Edison. And boy, I was looking forward to, to going to this place. I'm an Ohioan. I was born within 100 miles of where Thomas Edison was born. And every Buckeye admires this man for how he discovered the light bulb and invented it and made it available to all the world. And he started his own, his own electric company, surprisingly called Edison Electric. And uh, he was doing well. And so I went there and I saw a lot of things to admire about him, all the other things that he invented as well. And then I was getting kind of tired and I sat down and they were showing this, uh, this documentary about Edison. And it started kind of glowing and then it shifted. And all of a sudden, my hero wasn't the great hero that I thought he was. Because the documentary told the story of what is called the War of the Currents. This is something that happened within a couple years of 1890 because America was becoming electrified. But what was in the papers every day and what was in the discussion in every home was, do we dare let that dangerous power of electricity into our home? Won't we get electrocuted somehow? Won't our house burn to the ground somehow if something goes wrong? There was that concern. It was a leading news story for years during this period of time. And the two major combatants, they weren't the only ones, but the two major combatants were Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse. Edison was in New Jersey. Westinghouse was in Pittsburgh. They were both great inventors, had become rich inventing all kinds of stuff. And now there was this issue of electricity. And Edison took the side of, we must use direct current. Now, without getting too scientific, direct current, it's basically like trying to walk that you take one step and you don't stride forward. You just bring that foot up even with the next one. And then you take one step forward and you bring, in other words, you only take half a stride. It's like you're only using part of the power of electricity because electricity goes through a wave and direct current was only using half of the power of that wave. And as a result, that electricity couldn't go very far, just as you can't cover a lot of turf when you're taking half a step, and neither could it build up any kind of velocity because, I mean, try to run that way, taking half a stride. You can't do it. You're just going to wind up falling down. And according to, according to Edison, the key was to keep it safe. Everybody, I'm going to keep, I'm going to lead America in keeping electricity safe. 
But what it required was to keep it down to 110 volts. You can touch 100, 110 volts and it'll make you jump, but it's not going to kill you. It's, 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 you let go and, and you're okay. But it could only go a mile. And then you'd have to build a new power plant. And that power plant could cover about you know, a mile in each direction. So you'd have to have a zillion power plants and it would cost a lot to build those up and they'd have those noisy, loud power plants in every neighborhood. That was his plan. Meanwhile, Westinghouse said alternating current would make a whole lot of more sense because that's the equivalent of taking all the power of, of that wave of electricity, of that flow of electrons, and it can go fast. It can go far. The only problem was it just might kill you. <laughs> and there were cases where people did get killed by high voltage. And of course, it was headlines on the papers when those stories occurred. You see, and also there was one other little problem. That little problem was that people had invented motors that could run on DC, but nobody had figured out how to run a motor on alternating current. In other words, Westinghouse wanted to use it. He saw it was more practical in the long term. You have one power plant and you can send power out to cover several states. But he really didn't have the means to do it. So that was the war that was going on. So what happened? Who won? The loser in this war was Edison. He feared the power of electricity. He intentionally limited its power and its reach to keep it safe. In fact, he fought against AC by one of its major ways was to encourage the state of New York in its penal system, in its prison system, to invent a new way of executing criminals. The electric chair by AC because that would keep in the minds of the people that you don't want to touch that stuff. Hmm. He only saw the dangers. He only saw the dangers. Meanwhile, there was someone who had worked for Edison, but he grew bored with Edison, who then went to work for Westinghouse. His name was Nikola Tesla. And this guy was just a genius. Before he came to America, I believe he's a Serbian, before he came to America, while he was walking with a friend in a park, all of a sudden he just stops. And his friend says, what's happening? He says, I can see it. Uh, what can you see? I can see a motor that will use alternating current. I can see it. He didn't have the money to build it. In fact, there were several years, it was like six, seven years before finally he's working for Westinghouse and Westinghouse says, you think this is gonna work? You've, not, you, you've never built it. He says, I know it will work. And it did. And that, and, the, and also the uh, invention of transformers that you could rev it up to 10,000, 20,000 volts. And then just before it comes to your house, the electricity goes through a transformer and it goes down to 110, 120, and it's safe. Those two inventions, the induction motor of Tesla and the transformer, which was invented by a few different people together, that made AC now safe. There was great power there. Many people, including Edison, feared it. But there was a way to use it correctly. Does electrical current still kill some people? Once in a while. When you break the rules of how it's supposed to be properly used. But when it's used properly with these inventions of these forward-thinking people, Westinghouse and Tesla, look what electricity has done around the world. That's the story of the War of the Currents. And as I was watching this video, I wasn't just seeing that story up on the screen. I was seeing this very issue of 
Are the gifts of the Spirit safe or are they dangerous? And it's exactly the same thing going on. There's a great power there that's available from God, just as electricity is a power that's available from God. It was part of creation. He put it there at the beginning, but it took us till, you know, 1890 to figure out how to use it. There's this great power. And because sometimes it is misused, people started saying, I'm not comfortable with this prophet thing. I'm going to cross it off the list. Uh, words of wisdom, word of knowledge, healing, gifts of healing, miracles, spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. I'm not even sure about this casting out demons thing. They start crossing gifts off the list and say, those aren't available for today because whenever I've seen them used, it's divided the church. You see, the reason why we make our decisions in regard to the war of the current of the Holy Spirit's power is according to what we were taught and our experiences. I want to give you three examples of that, okay? The first one is the opinion of a church president. And I don't mean the president of a local congregation somewhere. I mean a whole denomination, like the bishop who's in charge of that whole denomination. In, uh, in a paper that was written in 2014, this church president was commenting about how the U.S. is becoming increasingly secular and there is a diminishing membership and church attendance in churches here in the United States. And he made note of this fact. Since 1970, only three American denominations have grown. The Southern Baptists grew at 42%. The Roman Catholics at 43%. And the Assemblies of God, oh, 396%. That's nine times more than the other two. And everybody else, including the church of this president, is negative numbers. It didn't grow, it was shrinking. And yet, in this article that the president wrote, he never asked, why are those guys growing at almost 400% since 1970? What's happening there? Seems that we ought to be asking that kind of a question. That a a denomination like the Assemblies of God, which seeks out the gifts of the Holy Spirit, might have something to teach us. Here's another opinion. This happened, uh, these two things happened within just a few weeks of each other. A seminary professor from the same church uh, wrote an article, and he was talking about uh, the international decline of churchgoers. And he noticed this, that the only exception to the worldwide decline in churchgoers is in the global south, where the growth is led primarily by Pentecostal churches. And rather than asking, why is that happening there? Instead, he just lists a few things about those churches. He says, well, they tend to be led by one very charismatic leader. They're always looking for uh, miracles and signs. And they're into that prosperity gospel thing that you'll have all kinds of financial reward if you trust in God. But what he's doing is simply painting a picture of their weaknesses, which in some cases are true painting a picture of their weaknesses so he doesn't have to ask, Lord, could you do among us what you're doing among them? That's the question that we ought to be asking. Now, when I bring this up about these two men, I'm not wagging a finger at them because I was kind of wagging the same finger myself till I was 57. I just kind of shied away from this stuff. I didn't know what to do with it. I went to be a, uh, in the early 1980s, I was a missionary in Venezuela, and that was one of those global south places where those churches were growing. And I ran into Pentecostal pastors who were really wacko. And I ran into other ones 
who were really solid proclaimers of the Word of God. So I saw the best and the worst. I moved to Caracas, and the largest church, the largest Protestant church in Caracas uh, was a Pentecostal church. And, but nobody called it by its name, which was La Iglesia Evangelica de las Acacias. Everybody called it, as I heard them refer to it, everybody called it the Church of Samuel Olson, the Church of Sam Olson. And so when I heard that, I thought, this guy's really on an ego trip, that everybody's calling the church after him, that it's his church. And that was kind of my attitude toward him. I had met him once very briefly. It was, you know, inconsequential meeting. And then towards the end of my time there, I was going through a very challenging experience in my life of having to leave Venezuela where I had wanted to stay. And I happened to be in a different place and I bumped into Sam Olson. And this was the only conversation that I ever had with Sam Olson. But he looked at my face, or maybe the Spirit told him something, and he knew here was a man who was broken. And he said, what's wrong, Phil? What can I do for you? And I told him. And that man ministered to my soul so deeply during that time for about 15 minutes. He prayed for me, he comforted me at that time. And here I had been accusing this man of being proud when I was the one who was proud. I'm not proud like you. Well, he had never called it the Church of Sam Olson. That's just what other people called it. Here was a man who was humble, and what I've discovered is that people who know how to use the gifts of the Spirit correctly have been humbled by God so they can use them correctly. So let's go on. Let's, uh, there's one more opinion we need to hear. This is the story of a guy who uh, went through some real experiences. His name is Paul. He was as against the work of Jesus and the Spirit as anybody on the face of the earth. And I'm only going to focus on his experiences that have something to do with prophecy. I'm not going to talk about healing. I'm not going to talk, uh, talk about other gifts of the Spirit. I'm just focusing on prophecy or receiving some kind of message from God. Here's what Paul experienced. It started on the road to Damascus when he was going there to arrest all the Christians. A brilliant light knocked Saul, Saul off his high horse, and Jesus spoke to him and commissioned him to be a missionary to the Gentiles. That's number one. Number two, shortly after that, this guy Ananias shows up and he said, I had a vision, and God told me to go visit you. And you know, there's a lot more detail there, but basically he welcomes him, he baptizes him, and all of that confirms that that crazy thing that happened to me on the road to Damascus must have been true because all these crazy things happened to Ananias and they mesh like that. Number three, while praying in the temple, Paul, uh, Saul falls into a trance in which the Lord warns him to leave Jerusalem because his opponents will not accept his testimony and so he gets out. Number four, in response to a prophecy spoken by Agabus about a coming famine, Barnabas and Saul deliver a gift of support for needy believers in Judea. They hear a prophecy and they respond to it. Number five, the Holy Spirit told the leaders in the church in Antioch to send Saul and Barnabas as missionaries. And they go out. Six, Paul's name is now, Saul's name is now Paul as he goes out into the Gentile world. The Holy Spirit prevents Paul, Silas, and Timothy from preaching in Asia Minor, which is Turkey. And then in a vision, a man of Macedonia, northern Greece, begs Paul to cross the Aegean Sea and help the Macedonians. And so they go. Number seven, when he gets to Corinth, which was a very difficult situation. The Lord encourages Paul in a vision to not be afraid, to keep on speaking God's truth. So Paul taught there for a year and a half. Number eight, Agabus, that prophet guy, warns Paul of his future arrest in Jerusalem. Nine, after that arrest, the Lord told Paul to take courage because even though you've been arrested, 
you're going to testify to me in Rome. And on the way to Rome, on the ship, there's this giant storm, and uh, everybody's in fear. It's been going on for two weeks. They think they're all going to die, but an angel brings Paul word, fear not, Paul, because you will stand trial before Caesar, and every soul on board the ship will survive. Those experiences totally changed Paul's life. And when we experience the work of the Spirit in our lives, when we open up our eyes and realize he's maybe been doing stuff already, and if we seek even more, we'll see that, wow, there's a lot to be gained here, a lot. And so kind of summarizing uh, these points about the whole war of the currents and everything, misuse is no excuse for disuse. Just because something does get misused somewhere, a particular gift or a particular ability, just because one church divides doesn't mean it always divides. Misuse is no excuse for disuse. Think about it. Strawberries get all kinds of stuff sprayed on them. Sometimes people get stick, uh, sick from strawberries. Have you given up food because sometimes it's tainted? No, you use it right. People get hurt driving cars. You've turned in your license, right? <laughs> no, we use it correctly. And it's the same way with the power of electricity, and it's the same way with the power of the Holy Spirit. Ah. <sighs> So how do we actually use these gifts properly? I was asking this question years ago, about, oh, eight, nine years ago, because I'd found out, well, if there's all these things that the Holy Spirit does, how does that change evangelism? It seems like it's a totally different game than I thought it was. And I was just kind of wrestling with that question. I didn't even know how, exactly how to phrase it. And I went out for a bike ride that lasted about two hours, and the whole bike ride, I was asking the Lord, explain this to me. And this is what he showed me as I was biking. By the time I ended it, I explained it this way. The normal way we view evangelism is like checkers. It's a simple game. I know there are expert checker players who can make it complicated and would beat me in 10 moves every time. I'm talking about the common way that normal people play these games, okay? Checkers is simple. It's for novices. And for people who don't know much about witnessing, they just, well, I make this little move here, and I say that little thing there, and it's all pretty cut and dried. But then there's people who learn a lot about it, like, like I did. I was a professor of evangelism and missions in a Christian college, and I had I taught this stuff for years. And so I could make this game that you play on the same board complicated because it was more like chess. And you had to be smart and you had to be able to figure out different strategies and stuff. And it just showed how, how wise I was. And if you use my approaches, then you're pretty wise too. And there's all kinds of strategies that we were learning and said, oh, these are so good. That's kind of like chess. You see, both of those games, those evangelism games on the, chess, on the chess level or on the checkers level, it's all about us. Yeah, we're sharing God's word, but it's my wits in figuring out when and how to share it. But then there's another game. Maybe you've seen it on some episodes of Star Trek. It's called 3D Chess, and actually there's four different kinds of 3D chess, and Star Trek is just one of them, that they made up totally, and then somebody wrote rules for it. But there's not one board, there are three big boards, plus there are two other small boards. So altogether, there's seven boards on seven different levels, and you're trying to figure out where everything moves, and it's just going, kind of, oh, how do you do that? And God said, that's how I do evangelism. And you know how to do checker style evangelism. And some people learn a little bit more complicated chess style of evangelism. But the Lord said, I can see down into the heart of a person. And I know about that, that, 
that young lady that Pastor Dodge referred to, and I can get somebody there to witness to them at that moment. I know those things, and I will lead you, and I will direct you. So, Lord, so how, how do I play that kind of game? And he said, it's really easy. Imagine me as your wise grandfather who knows how to play this 3D chess. And imagine yourself as a four-year-old sitting on my lap. And I tell you, move this piece there. Move that piece there. You don't know why. Just do it. You'll see good stuff happen. Just make those little moves. Just follow step by step as I guide you. And it will lead to victories in reaching people for Christ. Wow. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, how do we discover our gifts? I'd like to suggest three ways, and it's not that you can only use one of these. It can be a combination. Back in the 1970s, a lot of books came out about how to discover your spiritual gifts. I believe those were actually attempts by non-spirit-led churches to try to explain spiritual gifts in a way that wasn't that supernatural. And so their suggestion was the way you do is I have a little survey here that I've written in this course or in this book or whatever and answer these questions about what you like to do in a church and that'll show you where at least some of your gifts might be. And usually those and, and they said and then just go out and kind of search. You know just kind of but it's all about, notice, you're, it's searching for you. I'm trying to find my gift. And those approaches tend to emphasize you have one or two, maybe three or four gifts, that's it. But later on, I started learning about a different approach to this. And that is that you work with a team of people that you're all seeking to use all the gifts. And as you're using all those gifts, it becomes evident after a while, well, this person on my team, they really are gifted in this area. And this other person, they're really gifted in that area. But when we get together, we're not saying, well, when it's this, only you act. And when it's this, only you act. No, we do it together. We share it together. And all the gifts are available to all God's children to use at any situation, even when you're alone. But it's even better when you're in a team. The surveys and searching thing is kind of like corporate rules. It's individual oriented. It's mechanical. It's stiff. The teamwork approach to serving, it's fluid. It's personal. And it's alive because we're not searching for our gifts. We're serving someone in need and saying, Lord, which gifts do you want to give them? Give to that person. Bless that person with at this time. It's serving oriented, not me finding out what my gifts are. One last thing. I want to talk about the best gift of all. Can you go back one slide? Okay. I want to talk about the best gift of all. This is a gift that can be used with the others, okay? And you might think, oh, he's talking about love, right? Now that's called, Paul calls it a better way. This is the best gift, okay? A slight differentiation of terms. But this, I want to tell you about an experience I had on Easter Sunday morning, real early in 2010. The moment I got out of bed, I heard the Lord speaking inside my head. It didn't wake up Julie, but it was, it was loud to me. And it said, get up, I have a gift for you. Get up, I have a gift for you. Now you can go to the next slide. And I'm thinking, he means, he means one of those gifts. Because, you see, prior to this time, for the three weeks before, every morning I read 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, the main text, not the only text, but the main text in the scripture about spiritual gifts. I went, I've never really studied this that much. I've kind of avoided those chapters. I'm going to focus on them. And so I'd read it, I was reading them every morning and just going, Lord, what does this mean and how does this actually live out? And so when he says, Phil, wake up. I have a gift for you. I'm thinking, 
he's going to give me one of those gifts. And so I went down to where I usually have my devotions. And, uh, and I'm just praying like this. Okay, Lord, lay it on me. <laughs> and I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and nothing seems to happen. And so I said, well, is, Lord, is there, is there a verse maybe that, that would help uh, this process of receiving this, this, this gift? And he gives me this verse, Jeremiah 7.14. You don't have to look it up, but it is a verse about the temple being destroyed. And I'm going, well, that's some gift. And so, <laughs> so I read the whole chapter and I can't find a single gift in the entire chapter because it's a chapter all about the church in Jeremiah's time being like the church in our time, drifting so far from God that we're just going through the motions. And I'm going, what, the, what, where's this gift? You know, I'm just going to, I'm not getting it. And, and I've read the chapter like two times. And finally, I notice that there is one other little phrase that appears on that page in connection to chapter 7 of Jeremiah. It's something that I wrote in the column, I don't know when, at some future, at some past time. And it was in quotation marks, and the first person uh, pronouns in it are capitalized. So I realized this is God speaking. And so in other words, sometime earlier when I read this chapter, I sensed God was saying this in this chapter. And this is what it said. This is God speaking. Let me into my temple and your worship. And I went, whoa! We are keeping God out of our temples, out of our churches. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We can't keep God out of that. How dare we? He was begging, let me into my temple and into your worship. And so, remember, this is Easter morning. I start praying. I'm praying for the worshipers at my church that we will indeed let God into, into the temple, into our worship. I expand it beyond my church. I'm praying for Christians everywhere. And finally, I figured out, wait, i got to personalize this. And I prayed, Lord Come, in, make, come and make your home in me as you make me your temple. And the second that I prayed that prayer, this is what God said. I am the gift. <laughs> and I was just totally blown away and totally thrilled because he is the gift. We receive all kinds of gifts of salvation. But really what they are is he's simply giving us himself. We receive all kinds of gifts of material blessing. But he's really saying, this is just a gift for me. I love you. I'm your father. I share from my riches with you. We focus on spiritual gifts so that, so that we can exercise and do things for the kingdom of God. But ultimately, all those are just trivial little trinkets. He is the gift. And when we realize that, then we can't help but use the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a proper way and in a safe way and in a non-divisive way. That's what he will do. And so, one last slide. We're learning about discipling. This God who says, I am the gift, also promised us. He promised it to Joshua, and he promised it to all of us through the letter to the Hebrews. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always be present to guide you and any team of people that you are working with as you exercise my gifts. What I have always wanted to do is simply be by your side, to be your friend, to be your helper. And will you accept me as your friend and let me help you use all these gifts? That's exactly what he's calling us to do. And it's beautiful when we use the gifts of the Spirit 
with that understanding. The giver of the gifts is the gift. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Very good. Well, any questions, maybe specifically about anything, any of the gifts on the list or another thought that you might have? Yes. Um, I was wondering why is it that, I don't know if it's because people are more spiritual than others, but when they can do speak tongues or understand something, or if like people who like in, have a car accident and, and go to the other side and see, you know, the spiritual side, or they can see a uh, spiritual vision of, mm -hmm. of, you know, let's say Jesus or mm -hmm. an angel or... So why is there so much variety? Well, no. Okay. I guess why does it happen to some people and not others? Is it because they're, they're such, uh, they're so spiritually deeper than other people? Or I don't know if I'm making sense. So the, the, um, I'm repeating the question so that for sure the, the viewers hear it. Why is it that some people with these kind of supernatural type gifts, why, why do they experience it more than other people? Um, I think ultimately everybody could experience a lot of that. But there's also the aspect of the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts as he chooses. And so some will get a different mix than other people will get and will have different experiences. That person who, uh, who, who tends to be visionary and hears a message from the Lord, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, giving, for instance, or to witnessing, for instance, which are also areas of giftedness, they may feel like, boy, I don't have what it takes there. And so that's why this team body approach is so essential. He didn't give all the gifts to all of us so we'd all go, I don't need you. Instead, it's kind of like having, imagine that, imagine that your neighborhood didn't have a lawnmower in every garage and a different toolbox in every house, but there was one garage that you could all go to and that's where all the tools were. And you can share them. And some people, of course, are handier at some tools than other tools. That's kind of the situation, that it's available to all of us and we use them together. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah, Jan. Can you speak against the thought that those that have certain gifts are better Christians than others? Can I speak against the thought that those who have certain gifts are better than others? Absolutely. Because that, that is a main way that the devil does divide. He does it from both angles. Some, that some people fall to the temptation of, I've received this gift, oh, that makes me better. He attacks from the other side where in a, in a situation where somebody isn't saying, I'm better, but somebody sees them and says, oh, I'm not as good as them. They must think that they're better than me. See, they're, they're reading a thought into that person's mind that, that isn't there. But either way, the devil uses, I'm better, to divide. And the whole point of these gifts is it's back to that thought of, of, uh, of humility. You know, I, I, I looked at, at my friends, Samuel Olson in Venezuela, and thought, okay, you got a big church. It, it, his whole church was bigger than our denomination in that state <laughs> or in, in that country. And I, and I could feel like, oh, uh, you know, he thinks he's better than me. That was probably part of what was motivating me too. And when I finally recognized, no, it's humility. It's humbling ourselves before the giver. And before humbling ourselves to receive the ministry of the gifts that others have and that I don't have. And then God can really use us. We're out of time. Uh, when we get back, Kevin's going to talk to us about more about using the, these gifts in a team. It's going to be exciting. So even though you're going off for lunch, please come back. It's going to be worth it.